Ambassador Glendon, welcome. President Kilpatrick, welcome. All you beautiful ladies of Gibbon, sisters in Christ, brothers in the Lord, welcome. Today is the Feast of St. Barnabas, nicknamed Son of Encouragement. Doesn't he seem like a wonderful patron for, for this evening, for our lives? An anointed, faithful servant of Jesus and intimately involved with one of those unexpected and consoling stories of, in Scripture about the very human humanity of those chosen to be our first apostles. He and St. Paul, two saints, had an argument documented in the Word of God. <laughs> They're about to set out on a missionary journey, and Barnabas wants to take along Mark, another saint. And Paul says, no way. Mark had deserted them on a previous mission. <laughs> and while Barnabas is ready to forgive him, Paul was not. Scripture notes, quote, there arose a sharp contention <laughs> so that they separated from each other. Barnabas is a son of encouragement and of second chances. And even the argument between he and Paul allowed something wonderful. God works all things for the good for those who love him. Despite the awkward tension of this early conflict in the church, the message of Jesus was sent not to one place, but two. And three men, not two, became saints. Take a moment to think about your own lives, the path that you've walked. Have you ever needed encouragement? Mercy? <laughs> a friend? Someone who believed enough in you to let you try again? Take a look around this room. In each of our lives, there's been a Barnabas, maybe several. Perhaps one of your Barnabas is, is right here in this room with you. The greatness, the sanctity of each of us is the fruit not only of grace and of our own labors, but of the gift of others given to us. Tonight, at Givens Catholic Women's Leadership Celebration, we want to spotlight the grace of God and the superabundance of God's love for us, his gift to us. Almighty God did not think it enough just to will and love you into existence. Unique, unrepeatable. He didn't think it enough to share with you the splendors of creation the delights that come with being human, with loving and being loved. He didn't even think it enough to reveal his love in the flesh by becoming one with you, taking on your sins and failures and granting you in the place of loneliness and alienation, intimacy with him deeper than any other available to us on earth all the way to heaven. God also wanted you to share the joy he has in creating, in healing, in loving. He wants you to participate in his mighty works. And he lets each of us dream with him that others might experience his kindness, his peace, his joy, his life. He lets us dream with him. Midway through college, at the dawn of my adult life, my mind was being awakened to the joys of learning. My soul was waking up too as I encountered Jesus alive, loving me, present in the Eucharist and in the church. And I began to read about the women saints, St. Teresa of Avila, St. Therese, St. Catherine of Siena. Their passion and their greatness called to me. And my heart began trying to speak to me. You know how hard our hearts have to work? to be able to be heard. What I experienced was a restlessness and a desire, and it can feel like frustration, from which emerged a question. Where are the women with that same passion and love for Jesus, the same willingness to listen to him, to love him, 
to give everything so that he would be known and loved today in every sphere of life. Where were the Catholic women in our world who were confident that Jesus knows the hearts of women, doesn't put them in a box, were confident that the church needed them, and that, in fact, they, in a very special way, were the face of the church to the world? And why was it so difficult for me to see them? To find in them, even from a distance, mentors, encouragers, guides, sisters. As I shared or whined about this, I also dreamed with the Lord. He let me dream with him. What would the church look like if young women could have before them witnesses not just from the 15th century, but from the generation ahead of them living today? What would the church look like? As I spoke this desire and frustration, people began to share with me the names of women for me to look to. Among the first was Professor Marianne Glendon. Have you heard of Marianne Glendon? <laughs> Professor of law at Harvard, and at that time, just appointed to lead the Vatican delegation of the United Nations to Beijing, the first woman ever to be appointed to lead a Vatican delegation. I did my research in a pre-smartphone world and discovered that our dear Pope St. John Paul II had identified in Professor Glendon, and in fact, in the entire slate of women to attend that conference on behalf of the Vatican, living witnesses of possibility for me. Months after the Be Beijing event, I was asked to be a student ambassador to the Catholic follow-up conference to that UN conference in Beijing, and I had the pleasure of meeting Professor Mary Ann Glendon in person for the first time. You can just imagine how my heart sang. I was thrilled as a young woman to have the opportunity to meet and to hear her. I was in awe listening to her and convicted of the need to take my own place in living, witnessing to, and protecting authentic and bold femininity. It was also at that conference I met Helen Alvare, who I now count among my friends, and Mother Agnes Mary, SV, my encounter with whom I blame, happily, <laughs> for setting me on the course of my religious vocation. Needless to say, it was an important few days for the trajectory of my life. <laughs> our dreams are important to God. What our hearts speak, my sisters, even in frustration, is important to God. Those dreams are not just for you. They're meant to bless others, to encourage others, to bring life to others, to bring Jesus to others. Look around this room. What would the church look like if young women could have before them witnesses not just from the 15th century, but from the generation ahead of them living today. Tonight, we want to spotlight the grace of God and the superabundance of God's love for us, his gift to us in allowing us, when we put our five loaves and two fish in his hands, to multiply them for the good of many. Ladies of given, sisters in Christ, brothers in the Lord, this evening we have the privilege of honoring a woman who has received herself and her gifts from God and has responded magnanimously and magnificently with great fruit. Marianne Glendon is the learned, the learned Hand Professor of Law, Law Emerita at Harvard University and a former U.S. Ambassador to the Holy See who specializes in human rights, comparative law, and political theory. Her remarkable depth of knowledge, experience, and commitment has been recognized countless ways and myriad times. She has been a member of the President's Council on Bioethics, President of the UNESCO-sponsored International Association of Legal Science, She's currently a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the International Academy of Comparative Law, the Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences, and the Pontifical Council, Council for the Laity. President, uh, Professor Glendon was appointed by Pope St. John Paul II to lead the Vatican delegation to the United Nations Conference on Women in 1995, as I mentioned before, the first woman to lead a Vatican delegation. She received the National Humanities Medal in 2006. 
Professor Glendon has lectured widely in this country and in Europe and is author of numerous articles and books, including A World Made New, Eleanor Roosevelt, and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, A Nation Under Lawyers, Seedbed is a Virtue, and Rights Talk. Her most recent book, please get it and read it, is In the Courts of Three Popes. I'll repeat that title. <laughs> in the Courts of Three Popes published this year, and it's a memoir that's riveting to read and awe-inspiring for your heart. Undergirding these spectacular achievements is a beautiful and courageous faith and love for her family. Professor Glendon is a mother, a grandmother, and a great-grandmother. <laughs> and by her yes to the Lord throughout her life, she has been a beacon of hope to many. It is with profound gratitude and joy that the Given Institute presents Marianne Glendon with our inaugural Fiat Award, an honor intended to highlight our great God who promises to complete the great work he has begun in each of us and to honor the one who has said yes to this promise. There is no one we can think of more deserving of this award than Marianne Glendon. Allow me before I call Professor Glendon up to read the inscription that's on the back of this beautiful award. This is what it reads. <clears throat> Countless are the prayers of each human heart. Countless, too, are the answers to those prayers, the graces and gifts that abundantly bless each life. The faithful, particularly in Italy and South America, have long cherished the practice of adorning chapels and shrines with ex votos, from the Latin ex voto suscipto, suscipto, from the vow made, as an expression of gratitude to God for provision, healing, protection, and guidance that marked a circumstance or a life for good. The Given Institute exists to encourage young women and help activate their gifts through the welcome, witness, formation, and mentoring of mature religious and lay women in the church. The Fiat Award is our own ex voto. A public acknowledgement of gratitude to God for a woman who exemplifies the three pillars of given and who stands as a living testimony to the transformative power of a life dedicated to excellence and love. We are honored to present Marianne Glendon with the inaugural Given Fiat Award the three antique Italian ex votos of this award each carry an, an inscription, two with the initials PGR and GR, which is, stands for the Italian for graces received, and the third with an ornate M in honor of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Professor Glendon, as you and your accomplishments have prompted our hearts to gratitude, our hope is that these ex votos becomes prompts of gratitude for you for the personal graces you've received in your life, and for the ways that your life, like that of the Blessed Mother, has become a means of grace for others. Mary and Glenn, Glendon, we thank you, and we're honored to honor you. completely overwhelmed. Thank you, Sister Mary Gabriel, for your beautiful words. I'm, I'm honored and humbled and immensely grateful for having been invited to be part of this wonderful, exciting, promising event. When uh, Sister Mary Gabriel called me a few weeks ago and told me about Given, the Given Institute and its work, uh, what it's going to be doing for young women with a heart for mission. I love her expression, with a heart for mission. It's so beautiful. But when I heard her describing it, I thought, why wasn't there something like that available <laughs> to me and my contemporaries? <laughs> what a difference that would have made to me and all the young women I knew who had that feeling about mission, what a difference if we had had accompaniment, mentorship, formation, 
that is now going to be offered to women between the ages of 21 and 35. Just the ages when you really need formation accompaniment. And uh, I, you know, uh, when I was that age, in those years, Vatican II, this, I'm a very old person, Vatican, <laughs> Vatican II was just coming to an end. And the fathers of Vatican II said something amazing in their closing message. They said, the hour is coming, and indeed is at hand, when the vocation of women will be acknowledged in its fullness. The hour when women will acquire an effect and a power in the world that they have never had hitherto. And when I read those words as a young woman, I was so proud of my church. But I didn't have a clue about how we were supposed to respond to them. Uh, <laughs> totally unprepared. As Sister Mary Gabriel wrote me uh, in our correspondence, she said, there's a big gap in what young women after college are receiving from the church. And I can only second that after years of teaching and counseling young women, uh, this is the moment when they need it most. This is the time when we haven't done enough for them. Um, I often think, and this would apply to even younger women, I often think that today more than ever, the journey from childhood faith to some kind of mature Christianity, and I'm not pretending that I've reached that ultimate <laughs> stage, but the journey is more perilous than ever, and it's a time when so many drift away. So the, uh, the need is really urgent, and uh, the roots of that problem of formation, I'm sort of embarrassed to say uh, this about uh, where the church is on that particular point, but the roots go very deep. Already in the 19th century, St. John Henry Newman, he spent much of his life trying to convince the church leaders that clergy and laity alike were woefully unprepared for what he described as a world falling into skepticism and disbelief. Well, how much worse is that today, um, even a young woman today who has a solid Catholic formation, as I assume most of you do, even such a young woman needs accompaniment and support as she tries to discern her own particular journey. Uh, I mean, discernment, even of what you have to offer, discernment can be very tricky. In my case, when I reached the point where I thought family responsibilities and teaching responsibilities gave me a little time for service to the church, I thought, well, I'm a teacher, and so I will volunteer to teach CCD. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> it was a disaster. <laughs> teaching Harvard Law students is nothing. It's a breeze. <laughs> compared to eighth grade boys. <laughs> so uh, I had to do a little re-examination. Um, so those are just a couple of reasons why I'm so excited about this event, why I'm so excited about the Given Institute, and I'm so excited to see so many of you here. My prayer for you is that the Lord will multiply you and that each one of you will touch thousands of lives. Thank you. Thank you.